Hello class, welcome to a review session on respiratory system. Again, this is not me lecturing on everything I did over all the lectures, but uh, going to hit the high points. Some of you said it's useful, so now I'm stuck doing these. Kidding. All right, let's do it. So I took uh, our lectures and I um, kind of condensed them into something that I can uh, uh, follow along with to have me uh, remember what uh, points I want to hit. So this one, respiratory system, obviously big. It's a big killer. So you know your diseases, COPD, asthma, um, yeah, things like that. And then uh, importance, of course, is that it's going to deliver oxygen to all of our cells so that we can burn sugar and get enough ATP to survive. That's the point. And because we're so big, we need a complex respiratory system. When it comes down to it, the exchange has to be, there has to be a moisture. The oxygen carbon dioxide have to dissolve in water. So we need a large surface area for diffusion to happen. A very narrow, very narrow barrier between the, the fluid and the blood and the air. And uh, we need to refresh that air so that there's always that gradient with higher oxygen in the air than in the blood, and then higher levels of carbon dioxide in the blood and the air, then diffusion does the rest. That's what moves the gases. And because we don't live in water, we can't just have this wet film on us. We need to have these lungs. And so we have this whole anatomy to get the air in and out, muscles to move the air in and out. We ventilate by this tidal flow in and out, in and out to refresh that air. Yeah. All right, my first lecture, I started talking about, talking, uh, talked about smoking right away and uh, all the negative effects it has on the body beyond the lungs and respiratory system from diabetes to healing to get bladder cancer, all every, everywhere, right? Um, all these negative effects and uh, I talked about secondhand smoke and yeah, like, et cetera. Then I talked about how as a system, it's interesting because it's not tested before birth as our other systems are. Uh, it's bam, you're born, amniotic fluid, uh, we come out of that, we get rid of the fluid in our lungs, and <gasps> we just hope that uh, help that it works. And if I ask you guys, what's the main issue with uh, premature birth infants? You would say they're not making surfactant yet, which is necessary to reduce surface tension in your alveoli in order to uh, allow air to come in and for them not to collapse. So basics here, of course, respiratory system, we're gonna filter, we're gonna warm, we're gonna moisten the air. We're gonna get down deep into the alveoli. There's gonna be these little sacs. And that is where the gas exchange takes place in these alveoli. And again, here's blood, here's blood cells, and here is air moving in and out. And then the diffusion takes place against that tiny, tiny little respiratory membrane. And this looks like a multiple choice question. We talk about, you know, breathing is different than uh, respiration. Now, breathing is just the ventilation. We bring the air in and out, but then the gases will be uh, uh, dissolved in the blood and the liquid, then they'll be transported by our heart to our cells. And then those uh, gases will be offloaded, the oxygen, carbon dioxide will be unloaded. And then finally, that oxygen will reach the uh, mitochondria where we can use it at the final step to, uh, to make ATP from glucose. So, you know, it's all these steps, looks like a multiple choice question, probably is. And big picture, again, we have this uh, respiratory membrane. I ask you about how big is the surface area? It's about two square meters, like your entire skin all crumpled into your lungs in these little alveoli. And it's always wet, but not too wet, right? Um, meaning that your lungs aren't filled with fluid. There needs to be air, but it has to be a moist surface. And then uh, the bloodstream picks it up and it's going to carry, and you need to know how carbon dioxide and how oxygen are carried in the blood, right? Again, oxygen's bound to hemoglobin, almost all of it, 98%. And then um, carbon dioxide has three ways to get back, right? It's going to dissolve. Some of it will dissolve in the fluid. Uh, some of it will bind to the hemoglobin, to the globin, not the heme. And then uh, lastly, it, it turns carbon dioxide turns into uh, carbonic acid, which turns into bicarbonate ions. So those are the three ways. Carbon dioxide is a little more complicated, but oxygen binds to that hemoglobin. Uh, Anatomy-wise, I mean, could be a question on this. Just make sure you know uh, 
your upper respiratory tract, all that anatomy, looking at the nasal cavity, your oral cavity, your pharynx, it's the back of your throat, your larynx is your voice box, your esophagus, which we'll get to this last section is for digestion, would be in the back of, the, of that uh, larynx and trachea. And then, yeah, the anatomy, of course, as you go down the trachea, C-shaped rings made out of hyaline cartilage, open in the back, and then primary bronchi, secondary, tertiary, all the way down to alveoli. Yep, again, if I look at this, make sure you're familiar with this, you know, you know what's going on. If you took a sagittal section of your head, what's going on in your nasal cavity and uh, how it meets back here. So your nasopharynx, oropharynx, laryngeopharynx, like that, back your throat, right? And then we've got this palate that allows us to breathe through our nose while we chew, for instance, right? And this region here, you know, very uh, delicate. That's going to be our epiglottis, which would be have hyaline cartilage, elastic cartilage, actually elastic cartilage on it, right? And when you swallow, it's going to cover over your glottis, which is the opening to your windpipe, and um, it should snap back so you can breathe. So almost always, you know, the epiglottis is up, your air is going in and down, up and, in, up and down your windpipe, the trachea. But when you swallow, just for that instant, you want that uh, windpipe to be closed by the epiglottis. All right. And of course, you know, what's lining your nasal cavity, your trachea, your bronchi is this pseudostratified columnar with goblet cells and cilia. And so this mucus elevator that occurs all the way down our windpipe is going to trap pathogens, bacteria, dust, everything that's in the air. You know, it's going to trap it in that sticky mucus and then the cilia are all beating upwards where you eventually cough or swallow it. I talked about olfaction, which is smelling. And again, you can review that. I talked mostly we did senses last semester, but just know that you have olfactory receptor cells, you know, high up in our nasal cavity. When you breathe in, it refreshes that air so you can bring in uh, scents and uh, the olfactory uh, uh, nerve, cranial nerve number one, goes into your limbic system, which is uh, your emotions and tap to memory. So smells can really elicit uh, emotions even before you can uh, identify the smell. The sinuses, just know the four bones that we have these paranasal sinuses in. The, the big ones are the maxillary, then you have frontal, you have sphenoid and ethmoid in there. And they're all connected into your nasal cavity. Again, pharynx this is the back of your throat region. Some of it's high, some of it's up here. Your nasopharynx is up there. Um, the oropharynx, you look in the mirror, it's right behind your oral cavity. And then this is uh, some memorization, kind of like a map. So, you know, this is your larynx. And there's two cartilages I want you to know. This is your thyroid and cricoid cartilages, right? And then uh, here's the, the rings, C-shaped rings, like this open in the back. They go all the way down your trachea. And then you can see the primary bronchi. I mentioned the right one is bigger, more direct. So things tend to get aspirated in that side. And then you're gonna have lobar. You're gonna have, remember your right lung has, it's gonna have three lobes and your left is gonna have two lobes. And then you have tertiary and uh, goes on and on and on. Mm -hmm. Talked about that, talk about your vocal folds. You have false above true and how the pitch is how tight those uh, folds are and the overall size too, right? Um, and then the loudness is how much air you force out. Yeah, yeah. And then going down, this is the carina, is this keel that before it splits into your two main bronchus. That's how it's very sensitive. If something that touches that, you cough, right? And then tracheostomy, you know, that is putting an artificial hole below, which usually the obstruction will be problem up a little bit higher. Yeah, again, lungs with the lobes, you got it. It's the main branches here. You can see the primary bronchi, secondary, tertiary. And then, then we went on, right? Let's see. Yeah, it seems like a lot here, but eventually you get to bronchioles and you should know they're less than a mil, uh, millimeter in diameter. And by then the cartilage is gone. So lots of cartilage early on, and then it's just smooth muscle near the end, not cartilage. And then the cells go from big, tall, pseudostratified columnar. Eventually, they'll be cuboidal, and eventually, they'll be squamous in the alveoli. And then we talked about terminals, just going like a dead-end street. As soon as it's a respiratory bronchial, we did this especially in the lab. You know, we talked about where does, um, where does gas exchange take place from the respiratory bronchial on, because the respiratory bronchials have little alveoli on them. So then you have exchange, right? And eventually, alveoli are a duct to a sac to alveoli. 
uh, remember, lots of elastic fibers and smooth muscle. So we control the diameter of our tube, and then well, your lungs are elastic. And so when you inhale, you're stretching that elastic. When you exhale, it's almost passive as that um, uh, uh, the fibers just um, retract to the normal shape. Here's a little view. So again, a bronchus. Hey, I got some cartilage. Bronchiole, ah, no cartilage. Yeah, so I, again, I'm not, didn't, not gonna go into the detail I did in lecture, but you can see this is a view of lung. So you see the alveoli, those little squamous cells, there'll be tons of blood vessels going through there, right? Beautiful. And the alveoli, millions of them. And uh, the little sacs, the kind of polygons, they're not really perfectly like a grape, but they're little polygons. There's little pores that connect them. You have little macrophages that are zooming around, eating any bacteria in there. And uh, again, lined by surfactants to keep them from sticking together. Yeah. And when you look at the surface area of your lungs, just know it's like half the side of a tennis court. Just amazing how, how much surface area that is. Another view, wicked thin right there. You look at how squamous cells and just little capillary, little tiny uh, alveolar cell that's squamous, so very little distance for gases to uh, diffuse across. Here it is, again, surfactant, y'all got it. It's a soapy um, um, type of uh, chemical that you produce uh, late in gestation so that if you're born premature, you cannot make surfactant. They've got to spray some artificial stuff if you want to survive. And it's made by the type two cells. Type one cells uh, are just squamous cells. Type two will be in the corners and they look like this and they're secreting surfactant. So type two, type one. Alveolar cells, they're called pneumocytes, you know, air cells, alveolar cells, but type two make the surfactant. And so this is the barrier that's wicked important. Just like with the kidney, we'll talk about the filtration membrane. Um, here we're talking about the respiratory membrane. And you can see, this is the red blood cell. So you can see how thin that is. The, the, the distance between you know, your wet blood and your air. This is air. So super thin, there we go. And what makes that up? You're gonna have the endothelium, the squamous cell of the capillary. You're gonna have basement membrane from both of these. And then the type one alveolar cell, the squamous cell. So that makes up this super thin membrane. And here there'll be a thin layer of surfactant, that chemical. Yeah, and the inside is blood. This is your plasma. All right. Here's a macrophage, right? They're going to be eating bad guys down there and debris. All right, the pleura. These are the membranes uh, on the lung and then the chest cavity. And the visceral pleura is on the lungs. And the parietal pleura is lines the cavity. They're both wet. They secrete fluid. So they stick together like two pieces of wet glass. And that my people, is how your lungs inflate. What we do is we make our chest bigger and those pleura want to stick together. Actually, the more you pull the chest away, the more it wants to stick together because it kind of makes a vacuum. And that's going to inflate your lungs because they're stuck. And then you exhale, the lungs just kind of snap back, but they're still stuck, right? So the lungs are stuck to the wall and that's how you breathe. And so a collapsed lung, pneumothorax or air in there, if you have a, if it's not airtight, that lung will stay collapsed. Even though the wall is moving, the lung just sits here. So you've got to make it airtight again. There we go. So just look at this for multiple choice questions. You can see nasal cavity, sinuses, pharynx, larynx. Make sure you're ready, you know, if I ask you questions about, you know, any of these, these uh, places. All right. So basically, you're going to get this question. It's confused people. I, in lab, I watch you guys. You, uh, when you inhale, what you do is you make the pressure in your thorax slightly lower. And that makes this higher pressure in the room push the air in. And then when you exhale, you make the pressure in your chest a little bit higher and the air forced out. So, you know, air is always gonna go from higher to lower pressure. So just like that syringe, if you pull the, the stopper down, it's gonna make a vacuum and air is gonna come in. And then you push it up, it's gonna compress that uh, volume, making the pressure higher, air is gonna go out. So we breathe by negative pressure. Got negative pressure breathing because we make a vacuum. 
and the air. 760 millimeters mercury is at sea level is the atmospheric pressure is going to push the air in if we make a vacuum in our chest. So intrathoracic or intraalveolar, either one, pressure is like two millimeters of mercury less. So it's like 758 and the room is 760. And that's how we breathe in. And then when we expire, we make it like 761 intrathoracically or intraalveolar, one pressure higher and the air is gonna come out. All right, don't get that wrong. And of course, how do we make this vacuum in there? Is that usually our diaphragm. So our diaphragm is gonna contract. That means it pushes down. It's gonna push our guts down and our chest is gonna come up, makes it bigger. And so air is gonna come in, inflate those lungs. Here's your diaphragm, the phrenic nerve goes to it. Uh, the respiratory centers in your medulla and your pons, medulla and pons, they work together to send the signal down to your phrenic nerve and nerves of your chest to, to uh, coordinate speed and depth of breathing. breathing. And let me ask you guys, what is the key factor that's going to increase your rate of breathing? Is it oxygen levels? No, 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 right? It's gonna be carbon dioxide and pH, especially acidity, because carbon dioxide turns into carbonic acid, you know? So it's mainly we, we, we recognize um, when we're more uh, acidic and we're more carbon dioxide, then we start breathing, you know, faster. All right, getting ahead of myself, but you guys should better know that. Expiration, oh, I talked about it. Pneumothorax is a collapsed lung. And this just know, I talked about we're negative pressure normally, but positive pressure is if we forced air in, and that would be what we do sometimes medically, give mouth to mouth, we use positive pressure, but normally we make a vacuum. All right, spirometry, you know what that means, and it uh, measures the volumes of air, and you can add some volumes and it's called a capacity when you add a couple volumes together, but basically I'll just make a little drawing here. This is your tidal volume. You should need, you need to know it's about half of the liter is your normal in and out breathing, the tides in and out, but you have a, a uh, inspiratory reserve where you can <gasps> you can take in liters more. I don't think I'm going to ask you exactly, but no, it's got at least a couple liters more. And you can also, if you want to, <sighs> breathe out additional air it would be your expiratory reserve. See why it's reserved, both of those? Because normally your tidal volume, you know, you live in your life. But if you need to take a huge breath, we have this reserve that we can, we can call on. If you guys are running a sprint, <gasps> you're using that total amount, you know, sitting on the couch, you just you use the tidal volume. And then importantly, when you add up the uh, tidal plus the inspiratory and expiratory reserve, you're going to get what's called your vital capacity. And that's You guys need to know that. It's a big one. So people measure your vital capacity. And you do that by breathing in the deepest breath you can and breathing out as hard as you can. And that'll be that. And now, is that your total lung volume? No, because your vital capacity we can measure. But there's always air stuck in your lungs that you can't get rid of. We call that the residual volume. You can see it's like 1200 um, milliliters. So there's over a liter that even with your deepest breathing out, it stays in there. And so if you add that residual volume with that vital capacity, you will get your total lung capacity. And you can see five, six liters. And what does this depend on? You know, if I asked, like I looked around the room, I looked, took two of you students and said, you know, could I tell you your vital capacity? I can estimate based on if you're uh, male or female and how tall you are. Yeah, that's basically uh, two of the most important variables. You know? And the bigger you are, the bigger your lung capacity and males have bigger than female on average lung capacity. There you go. All right, some things like, remember with the heart, we had cardiac output. Well, here we have minute ventilation and that's how much air is gonna move per minute. And about 12 breaths a minute on average. And remember that tidal volume is about half a liter. So we're talking about uh, six liters per minute of air. It's exchanging. Now, if you tell yourself, oh, okay, so we have six liters of air of fresh oxygen. We don't. Okay. Because your minute ventilation is how much air you're moving in and out of your lungs. But it turns out that as you breathe in and out, because it's tidal, because back and forth, it's not very efficient. There's always air stuck in your windpipe, right? And all the pipes. The only air that counts for exchange is when it's in the alveoli down deep in your lung, right? So there's a better, I mean, a more accurate uh, measurement of how well you can, you know, exchange gases with your blood. Instead of minute ventilation, it's alveolar ventilation rate. So how much air is being actually exchanged deep in your alveoli? 
And to get that number, you just subtract um, the dead space. And the dead space, out of that 500 mils, it's gonna be about 150 mils uh, that's gonna be trapped. And you can have like anatomical dead spaces just in your, in your tubes. And then there's also this um, uh, dead space if you have damaged lungs. So often, you know, a person's lung has emphysema. So like half of it might not be useful at all. So that goes into the dead space, like uh, technically. All right, and again, I could ask you a question, uh, you know, hiccuping, yawning, laughing, sneezing, coughing, right? Sneezing clears your upper respiratory tract. <laughs> Coughing clears your lower respiratory tract. Hiccuping is <laughs> rhythmic um, contraction of your diaphragm. We don't know why. All right, All right and again, asthma. Um, a lot of you out there could tell me a lot more about asthma because I don't have asthma. And so I don't know a lot about it, but I mean, I'm, I know a lot about it, but no, no personal experience. But what's going on is that the, your tubes, the main thing with asthma or COPD, lung functioning, look at that. That was that, remember that formula? FEV1 over FVC. That is what percentage of your vital capacity can you blow, blow out in one second? Whew. Now, how much can you blow out in one second? And if it's over 90%, you're good, right? But it gets down to 70, 60%. That means you're, you're breathing out slowly. Why? Because your tubes, your air tubes are constricted somehow. And the two issues with asthma is the muscles constricting it and then too much mucus, like clogging up the pipes. And imagine trying to, you know, suck a, a soda from a little tiny cocktail straw. Oh, so much resistance, right? Same thing, trying to blow out of it. Imagine blowing a balloon with a little tiny cocktail straw and then a big straw. Oh, the resistance is less, it's, the air moves faster. So with asthma, you have this um, caused usually by allergens, but it can be exercise or cold induced, but your, your muscles constrict. There's often too much mucus. And so um, to fight this, you have inhalers, albuterol, things like that to relax those um, muscles so you can breathe. So asthma is reversible. Now, I think I'm gonna talk about th COPD. That's called chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Big killer, so you need to know what COPD means. And the two things with COPD are emphysema and uh, yeah, chronic bronchitis. Emphysema is when your alveoli coalesce in these big pockets which lack that surface area. And it's non-reversible, nothing you can do about it. Smoking is like mostly the cause, yeah. smoking. Yeah. And then, um, um, yeah, bronchitis too. You get, you get constricted bronchitis and then no amount of inhaler does anything for that. So yeah, avoid this. And then lung cancer is not the most common cancer, but it's one of the deadliest. So um, yes, when we look at cancers, you say, oh my God, skin cancer is so prevalent, but many times it's just an easy outpatient procedure. Pancreatic or lung cancer, you get something like that, it's like, oh, okay, that's rarer, but um, your chances of, uh, your prognosis is much worse. All right, getting into the physiology of it. And again, it just know that breathing is both voluntary and involuntary, right? When you're sleeping, your body knows what to do. And then where's the center? Medulla and pons controlling it, right? And then getting this physiology, again, realize that um, one atmosphere in physics is 760 millimeters of mercury pressure of the atmosphere pushing down on us everywhere, always. And know that air is mostly nitrogen. It's about 21% oxygen. So we talk about partial pressures are kind of a concentration measure. So partial pressure of oxygen, let's say it's 21% of the air and 21% of 760 is going to be like 160. So know that the partial pressure of oxygen in this room is 160. Now, when it gets deep in our lungs, it's gonna be like 104 because there's always dead air, but we always kind of refresh it. So, yeah. yep, cool. And the deal is, like I say, it's it's all diffusion. Um, we just have, uh, can I write on here? Yeah, 104 oxygen here. Let's say it's coming back as like 40 in the beginning. Oh, the oxygen is gonna like go into that blood big time. And let's say carbon dioxide is going to be at 45 in here. It's like 40 up in the alveoli. Carbon dioxide is going to move the other direction. So always, you know, gases move from high to low concentration. There we go. And then when that blood uh, eventually is going to um, leave the lungs, get back to the heart, it's going to be about 95. It's going to be the partial pressure of oxygen in the, in the blood. And then... Um, 
Yeah. As it moves through the body, it's going to reach the cells of the body. So here, like, here's your foot, you know, the blood's going to reach here. And out here, it's like really low oxygen. So the oxygen is going to leave the blood and go into the tissues. And carbon dioxide is going to be the other way. We're going to come back to the heart. So hope you guys get it, is that it moves, oxygen is, is loaded up in the lungs. The heart carries it to your tissues. It's unloaded. Carbon dioxide is loaded up, brought back to the heart, goes to the lungs, and diffusion loads, you know, reverses that. All right. All right, as I mentioned, um, what controls your breathing is not oxygen levels, unless it's like seriously low, it's, it's pH. And again, you should know why. Carbon dioxide turns into acid. So if I hold my breath, I become acidotic. If I hyperventilate, I become alkalosis. I get alkalosis, I become too high a pH. So breathing definitely controls our pH and pH controls our, our breathing. And again, because that's why if you give someone carbon dioxide, it really gonna make them breathe faster because that's what's being uh, measured, not really oxygen levels. And also, you know, pH can also be brought, you can have a uh, um, more acidic blood if you're working out anaerobically, like lactic acid builds up, right? When you, when you burn sugar without oxygen. So that will also increase breathing, you know, outside of uh, oxygen at all. All right, so receptors are either peripheral, we have some in our aorta and our carotid arteries, and centrally receptors in our brain where we uh, measure the pH. And you should know that oxygen has to be below 50%. Now that rarely happens because another amazing thing here is that I mentioned the blood, it fills up with oxygen, almost 100% in your lungs. I would think that you would use the oxygen up just like your car use up the gas and you come back to refill it, it come back and empty, right? But it comes back 75% full. So your body is like topping off your car when you're at three quarters of a tank. Why? Well, the reason is it gives you this, um, this cushion and allows you to have these, you know, exercise, you know, intense exercise. And you can, then you can, you can use that extra. If you were living on an empty tank, there's not a lot of wiggle room to go from there, right? So it's pretty cool. We float up completely with oxygen, the hemoglobin, and we come back at three quarters of a tank. And so normally oxygen is never going to trigger this because it got below 50%. But, you know, if you, if you have diseased lungs, you know, then it becomes important, you know. Uh, but uh, for you guys in normal situation, uh, carbon dioxide and pH are going to control breathing. Uh, hyperventilating is going to make you get rid of too much carbon dioxide. You become more basic or more alkaline. And then you should know too that, you know, normally let's say you have 250 millimeters of oxygen, uh, milliliters of oxygen per minute, you can crank that up over 10 times. So when you're breathing and you saw that was spirometry, you know, tidal breathing, tidal uh, flow is like here, but we can like really crank up the breathing. So when we exercise, we take in much more oxygen, much more air. I know what sleep apnea is. Um, centrals, you know, your brain stops telling you to breathe. It's a problem with, with babies. And then obstructive, usually in adults, where uh, you stop breathing because you got a big uvula or soft palate and you wake up all during the night. All right, these gas, these numbers, again, just only a few numbers you need to know is that um, in the, the air in the lungs, it's about 104 millimeters of mercury oxygen. Okay, in the blood returning, you can see it's like 40. So there's a big difference there. So oxygen is going to rush in and it's always going to equilibrate. So these numbers are going to be the same as in the lung because that's the exchange takes place and there's no more exchange. And then carbon dioxide is like 45. And in, in the air that we breathe in and our lungs is like 40. So carbon dioxide is going to leave the blood and it's going to equilibrate. So know that in your lungs, the air in your lungs and the air in the blood leaving immediately leaving the lungs, just before it leaves the lungs, is going to be the same. 104 oxygen, 40 carbon dioxide. Yeah. And then your lungs, blood from the lungs itself is going to use up some oxygen. So it's going to be 95. If you take arterial blood from your hair, it should be 95. Cool. And then in your tissues, everything is opposite. Oxygen levels are going to be low, so oxygen is going to leave the blood. Carbon dioxide is going to be high in your tissues. It's going to leave and go into the blood. 
All right, and what's gonna make um, hemoglobin let go of oxygen? These factors are very important. They're gonna be, uh, um, what does it say here? Carbon dioxide levels, acidity, and temperature. So imagine you're working out a muscle. It's gonna get warm, lots of carbon dioxide because you're burning sugar, and that's gonna turn into acid. So these things make oxygen leave. And so it's this beautiful system where the oxygen leaves our blood in the tissues that are using the most oxygen, where there's the lowest oxygen levels, it's gonna leave. And when our blood courses through our earlobes, not using much oxygen, it's gonna hold on to it. It's gonna let go of a little bit. But in your biceps, as you're really feeling the burn, it's gonna let go of that oxygen where you need it. So oh, the tissues of your body are oxygenated and carbon dioxide is taken away just where it needs it. And it's done without any brain. It's just done by chemistry. So cool. Again, carbon monoxide binds just like uh, oxygen to hemoglobin. And uh, you get too much of this, it's going to not have any room for the oxygen. It's deadly. Again, myoglobin is a type of hemoglobin in muscles that holds on to oxygen. Ah, and then again, if I ask you, I think I probably will. I'm definitely going to ask you oxygen, carbon dioxide. You know, how do they move? How do they move in the bloodstream? Well, you can see uh, uh, most of it is going to be through bicarbonate ions. So carbon dioxide is going to bind with water through an enzyme called carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic, carbonic anhydrase combines oxygen, combines carbon dioxide with water to make carbonic acid. And so that's how it's going to come back. And then uh, about 23% is going to, the uh, carbon dioxide is going to bind with um, uh, hemoglobin, but not the heme with the oxygen. So it doesn't compete with it. It binds over here. And then 7% just strictly dissolves in the fluid, in the water. Back at the lungs, everything reverses. And so it dumps the carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. All right, so make sure you understand that, how oxygen is carried, like almost all of it is bound to the heme, the iron of hemoglobin, right? And carbon dioxide, a little fancier, it's got three ways it gets back. All right, so lastly, I'll finish up with this, you know, looking at uh, lifespan changes and, and, you know, you lose like a foot of respiratory membrane every year after age 30. You know, so your surface area cuts down, but normally you don't notice a big lifespan changes um, with the respiratory system, unless there's some kind of disease, uh, which means that as you get older, you become less, you're running less sprints, you're playing less football. And so, uh, you know, you, you, if, if you try to exercise and climb a mountain when you're 80, then you realize it. But what I'm saying is with life, you become less active. And so you don't really notice the lesser ability of your lungs normally. But all those diseases, especially smoking, the major cause of lung disease, but uh, cancer, emphysema, COPD, uh, these things, uh, of course, are deadly. You know, once you lose lung function, you know, you need it. You know, you need that, right? So yes, uh, cilia, less active, definitely less uh, fighting off infections. And um, you become less flexible too. You, you get a different posture. And so you get this barrel chest where you, you guys are flexible. Your chest moves. Everything's cartilage is nice and uh, flexible. But as you get older, um, uh, not so much. All right, uh, half an hour or so, I guess. Yeah, I, I, again, I do my best on these to be as helpful to you as possible. You know, I want you guys to do well in this test. So uh, uh, I go through it uh, rapidly because you should have you know, studied this by now. And hopefully you, some things click or you realize, oh, I didn't really study how carbon dioxide gets back. And then it'll, it'll force you to go back because I'm telling you, you know, it's, it's important in case you didn't pick up on it. <laughs> All right, very good. I'll do one of these now on urinary and fluids and uh, hope it's helpful for you guys.